Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. From the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. World Headquarters in New York. And right next to her, I'm Ed Ludlow. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full coverage ahead of the state of artificial intelligence as we sit down with OpenAI COO Brad Lightcap. You do not want to miss it. Plus, we'll take a deep dive into Apple's robot ambitions as the company eyes the next big thing after scrapping its car ambitions. Details to come. And Paramount, it inches closer to a deal to merge with David Ellison's Skydance Media. We'll bring you the latest and so much more throughout this hour. We're also going to be more going more broadly as to what the space is like in the chip sector and ultimately where we are in this AI hype or reality cycle, how you can still be committing money towards it. So pleased to welcome into the show Melissa Otto, head of TMT research at Visible Alpha. And well, give us your research deep dive at the moment, Melissa, because are you feeling in this environment with benchmarks near record highs with another 70% added to NVIDIA over the course of this year alone, that this is still a buy, that the earnings still show growth potential? First of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's so great to be here and, and talk about technology with the two of you. It's a real privilege. I mean, NVIDIA, the story of the past 12 months, no doubt. I mean, based on Visible Alpha consensus, we've seen our upward revisions from last January come up over $200 billion. So we're at an interesting inflection point. Are we going to see earnings estimates be revised up yet another $200 billion? You know, when I look at previous cycles where we have new products like the iPhone or the internet, you know, and a, a totally new type of cycle coming into the mix, how big could it be? You know, I think in the beginning of those types of cycles, we can be cautious, conservative. But then looking back five years, looking back on those, it's like, whoa, I thought, I thought my numbers were crazy, but actually they were pretty conservative. You know, I think these are the questions that investors are asking themselves right now, and, and that's what we're watching in our well, data. They get asked the questions on a more than daily basis. The news flow around AI for every company, uh, at every layer of the AI stack is astonishing. Google is the example this morning, right? Mm -hmm. And the reporting is that they're looking at search and thinking, do we charge a premium AI-powered search on a subscription basis? How much of a domain do you find search to be in this wild AI story? Google has owned the search space for as long as I can remember. They dominate, they generate incredible revenues from that. It's been probably the story of the past 15 years in terms of what their growth has been like. What will be really compelling um, will be to see what Microsoft does mm. with their search. Are they going to start to nip at some of that market share? Are they going to start to... Uh, integrate AI in a way that isn't charging a fee? I mean, what's the business model there? Why would users pay a fee for AI when there's other options out there? And I think, you know, there was an upgrade um, yesterday with Dolly, and, you know, the, the market came out and showed, you know, the, the capabilities of open AI are just remarkable. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to stick around and listen to the open AI interview. I mean, this is, it, it's incredible what they're doing. Well, what is it you'd want to learn about open AI when you're listening to the interview? Oh, I mean, I would love to hear what they're doing, what their new upgrades are about, where they see it going next, what dynamics... Enterprise or consumer? Where are you more focused? Both. I mean, it, it's all about, right now, it's, I think the foundation of AI has been all about, it, it's essentially been funded by cloud service providers. Yeah. And taking it from cloud service providers, getting it into enterprises and really not only generating productivity and efficiency gains, making organizations more intelligent, but also finding new business models, yes. new ways of thinking about the world. I mean, this is what the iPhone did so remarkably well. Can AI do the same thing? This is what we're all waiting for. What new, what new apps are going to come out? What's going to change our lives? And it feels as though it's a lot of organic growth that you're focusing on. And it's interesting that we come off this day of a report in Reuters that maybe a bit of inorganic growth could still be done in this irregulatory environment if the reports are true that Alphabet is eyeing HubSpot, for example. Do you think that sort of a deal can get done? Are you expecting any more consolidation of such large players? 
It's a tough one. It's really difficult to answer and to address questions on deals. I mean, it's such a dynamic market. It, it's, a, it's a good market right now probably for M&A. For aqua um, hires, more likely that we seem to be happening with Microsoft rather than actually doing deals. It'll be interesting. Yeah, I think I, I, would, I would just pivot on that and say, you know, I think we... We really need to look at the dynamics in the market, see where the trends are going to lead us and where users are actually going to drive revenues. And if that's going to be the case, then, you know, th who knows what could be on the horizon. Later today, Caroline and I will be upstairs at Bloomberg Intelligence's AI Summit, our research arm. And when I think about generative AI, I always feel like we, we covered it in reverse. We went straight to the consumer-facing chatbot and not really how we got there along the way until GTC when Jensen Wang walks into the middle of the showroom floor and praises Michael Dell and says, if you need a server, go to this guy. Yeah. Well, what did you make of that? Because Dell is like, a name wow. you hold, right? I mean, this was new. This was absolutely new. I mean, he kind of called out and he's like, who else could make better end-to-end -end solutions for enterprises at a large scale than Mike Dell? And the whole, you could almost feel everybody go, oh, whoa, you know, and I thought that was really interesting because that's the next big leg that needs to come into AI is for um, there to be real strategic uh, thought into how organizations, enterprises are going to really embrace generative AI and what it's going to actually do for their, it's, this is very transformative. It's not like you just flick a light switch and there's an app and suddenly you have generative AI. I mean, a lot needs to happen in an organization. They need to de-silo their data. They need to train it. It needs to um, be in the cloud. It, there needs to be analytics around it. There's so much that actually needs to happen. And it'll be fascinating to see, you know, what role companies like Dell play right. in this arena. Um, and now we're talking about infrastructure and supply chain. Melissa Rado, <laughs> head of TMT Research at Visible Alpha. Thank you. Meanwhile, I want to bring an update to our audience on what's happening in Taiwan, following the largest earthquake there in 25 years. While the full extent of the damage from the latest quake isn't known, the latest figures are 10 people have died and more than 1,000 have been injured. Companies have also provided updates on employee safety in their operations. Taiwan Semiconductor resumed production less than 24 hours after evacuating staff and halting operations. The company said there has been no damage to its most critical chip making equipment. It expects full operations at its main plant to be fully recovered by later today. Some of the island's tech firms are still assessing the damage from the earthquake which leveled dozens of buildings on its eastern side. We will continue to monitor for the latest headlines and bring them to you as they cross the Bloomberg. Cara. More coming up. Now we're returning our attention to Disney. It was an extensive proxy battle. Bob Iger has defeated, from a board perspective, the billionaire activist investor Nelson Peltz. But actually, who's won out here? We discuss. This is Bloomberg Technology. votes they're in months of spending millions to win over investors both retail and institutional but the battling opponents in the press has now become a reality that Bob Iger has emerged victorious in the proxy battle with Nelson Peltz from Tryon more broadly we want to bring in Crystal C for more because ultimately with a 30% let's call it rally in Disney shares over the course of this year many would say Nelson Peltz has ended up winning out no matter what financially mm -hmm. but mm. has this changed the tone of Disney going forward so actually Peltz has said in some interview that he's rather be rich than right and I think he's <laughs> somewhat achieved that goal like you said the stock's up 30 percent and he first came to the stock in 2023 this is actually his second go around with Disney so the couple of things that he's pushing for at Disney is going to become the things to watch and some of the things our Iger had personally expressed um, kind of shared sentiment of for one thing is succession who is going to succeed Iger and that had come up again and again and the other thing is streaming and how they achieve uh, profitability when it comes to streaming and achieve Netflix like profitability profitability that's also come up right so those are the things that investors are going to watch from now on the, the pressure is on Iger still because he promised the profitability by the end of 2024 and, and when you have a proxy battle it's that it's a battle and often in the media where you go out and say oh well, I'm doing this and everything's great the pressure is also on Iger because uh, one of his, what do you call it, adversary? Elon Musk 
is still talking about this on social media yeah. and it's an interesting dynamic. That's right. So Elon, I think it's someone uh, Peltz has called a personal friend, and he obviously thinks very highly of Elon. Elon even tweeted that he thinks Peltz should be on a Disney board. And interestingly, with so much retail influence, he actually yeah. tweeted after the retail voting deadline was closed. So I actually don't think it achieved very much when it comes to like point. polling votes for, for, for Peltz. But he... he Elon is definitely interested in the situation, and whether um, he's going to go against Iger, we don't see that. I don't think there is any particular beef between the two men, but um, definitely an interesting dynamic with all the very high-profile uh, billionaires, billionaires, just, billionaires just right all around the same Mudsling. situation. Yeah, it's interesting. But at the end of the day, sources told us what 94% of, of the vote went to, to Iger's re-election, and Disney got all their nominees, nominees in. Bloomberg's Crystal Z, terrific reporting all week long. Pigment, a business planning platform used by companies like Klarna, Figma, Poshmark, but it's raised another $145 million. This is its Series D funding round. It was led by Iconic Growth, but other investors like Felix Capital still on board with it. And it's just 10 months after the latest financing. Please to welcome Pigment co-founder and co-CEO Eleanor Crespo joining us now. And you have some big VC names behind you. You have more money raised. And I, the first question is always, what do you do with it? Where are you deploying the money? Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. So I think uh, it's very simple. Um, we have been very lucky actually to do this fundraising. Uh, we didn't need that money. Uh, we had an amazing traction last year that led to that fundraising. We did 3x in our revenue and we managed to send amazing customers. What we'll do is very simple. It's a freedom to innovate. We launched about 100 product innovation last year with Pigment. And we plan to keep innovating very, very fast. Uh, with AI, of course, I think we'll discuss AI, but uh, with many other things that will make Pigment successful uh, in the future. Okay, so let's talk about that innovation and freedom to do so. Product innovation has been bringing basically generative AI to make your product easier to use. People are using it across different parts of their businesses. How is generative AI helping with strategic planning so much more? Yeah, so generative AI actually uh, has an amazing application at Pigment. Um, I think, you know, an application like Pigment, back office application like Pigment, use generative AI in general to democratize the access to data. At the end of the day, our customers, what they want is to give access to data to as many decision makers as possible in a company. With the revolution of generative AI, it is actually ma be made possible because you can ask any question in natural language. To give you an example, our customers today with Pigment can ask questions such as, what was my PNL last year in the US? Uh, give me my gross number in natural language. And this is a phenomenal uh, revolution for companies. Uh, Eleanor, it's Ed in New York. You talked about 3xing revenue. And I think that last time you were on the show in June of last year, you also said that when you raised the funds, you didn't really need them. So talk to me what's changed over the last nine months or so and what the company's been up to. Yeah, well, I think it's the exact same story here. It's actually a run from our internal investors. Um, we had a lot of interest in the past two months from external investors, uh, given that we managed actually to go up market. Uh, we signed uh, incredible customers, Fortune 500 customers in the likes of Unilever, Merck. We signed customers in the likes of Datadog, Kayak, Sense in the, in the tech industry. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, what is always very important for us is to have the freedom to execute. And Iconic actually decided to double down alongside IVP, Meritech, and Green Oaks to actually tell us, look, we're here and you, we will let you innovate and double down in the US and in Europe at the pace that we need to, to go at. The pace, because you're expanding geographically, you were entering North America and now you say most of your company's revenue is coming from this region. Where are the pain points, Eleanor? Is it the talent that you need to onboard to be able to ensure that you're basically meeting clients where they're at? So I think for us, uh, one, one of the area of expansion is definitely uh, keep being the U.S. 50% uh, of our revenue today comes from, uh, from the U.S. and this is our number one market. So for us, the big challenge is to keep doubling down, keep signing Fortune 500 companies. And as I said, probably the most important is to build this product that satisfies this customer base. And this is where we are going to spend most of our time and effort in the next few years 
to create this incredible platform. One of the other challenge for us is that we are creating this multi-product platform because it's a platform that can serve any team in a company. The challenge is to serve any decision maker from sales to supply chain to finance to HR. This is what we're building. Pigment co-founder, co-CEO Eleanor Crespo, great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much. There is other funding news. Chip startup Seema AI just raised $70 million in a new round led by Maverick Capital. The goal, to develop chips designed to speed up AI applications within everyday consumer devices from cameras to cars. Here for more is the Seema AI CEO, Krishna Rangasei. Uh, Krishna, same question that Caro led with. What do you use that money for? We are building and building upon the momentum we have in our Gen 1 product. And as you talked about, our Gen 1 product focuses on computer vision, solving problems in robotics, automotive, medical, and smart vision systems. We are extending that platform now into moving into generative AI, uh, generative AI applications. And we are now going to be using the capital to accelerate the development for generative AI. Krishna, let's talk about the technology then. Are we talking SOC or system on chip? Uh, technology or is this this uh, uh, basically a data center chip that's more targeted at, at training neural networks uh, no we, we are focused on a different market space and the cloud and the consumer experience in AI has been well built out we are focused on the edge market we're focused on things that touches the physical world robotics industrial automation automotive and and applications that really day-to-day -day affect our lives and that's really the focus for us and we are also not in the training business, we are in the inference business, where effectively people can deploy applications on our chips directly. That, that's exactly where I want to go next. It's an interesting choice. I, AMD did something similar with their AI accelerator, right? They came out with the MI300 generation and said, we're mostly focused on inference because that's where the world is now. The training has been done. So what kinds of companies are you seeking to partner with that have already done the training? Right, so I think this is almost every massive edge AI company. And so you could take the top five leaders in robotics, industrial automation, or in automotive, or in the medical market. We are engaged with the top five customers in these market segments globally. And we are scaling. Today we are engaged with 50 customers. And in the next few years, we'll be increasing our reach to 1,000 plus customers. What, when it comes to your fundraise, you're saying you're this is about scaling too, and we heard similar from Pigment. Is it that you need to spend more on talent? Is it that you need to spend more on infrastructure? Is it, where are some of the amounts that you need to be doubling down in from a cost perspective? All of the above. Yeah. And so I think no doubt talent and R&D talent in AI is really something we have to aggressively keep up with. I mean, the technology is changing at such a fast pace. We really need to scale and make sure that we are leading the pack, if you will, right? So that's one area of investment. The second one is go to market. And AI adoption is really still nascent in the mm -hmm. edge market. I mean, the cloud and the consumer market has really adopted it quite well. The edge market is going to be the next gold rush for AI. And this is going to take over the next 10 years. And reaching these customers, and unlike the cloud and the consumer market, we are reaching tens of thousands of customers. And so reaching them enabling the technology and making it really, really easy to use is really where we're going to deploy the capital. I just want to have you articulate, paint the picture of what, therefore, I'm going to be able to do through the power of your technology in 10 years' time that I just can't do now. You, every single thing we touch in our life will have AI. And much like we interact with human beings, we'd be able to interact in context of visuals, touch, feel, and really be able to really interact with technology in such a way that we have never imagined before. And today, systems are unimodal in that you either do computer vision, or you do audio, or you do text. You're going to see merged platforms, and which is a new trend called multimodal generative AI, where you're going to now be able to do everything you do with a human being, but now with every appliance that's going to be around you. Krishna, have you phoned Tesla to pitch your technology for the Optimus program? <laughs> so we, we are reaching out to ma very many customers and we are leading the industry in what we are doing today in three vectors. We are leading the technology roadmap in the performance we offer on our AI ML platform. We are also leading in terms of power efficiency which is another really critical problem at the edge. And the third one is ease of use and this is what we need to do to increase the breadth of what we do. So we are engaged with a lot of customers today and like I said I think today 50. 
But we really have very big ambitions for the company, and one day we want to be the de facto leader servicing 10,000 plus customers globally. 70 million is going to be going a long way for that. Seema AI CEO Krishna <laughs> Raganasi. It's great to have some time with you. Thank you for coming in today. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Ed Ludlow. One of the names that has a big balance sheet might be less sensitive to rates is Apple. Apple, interesting, up a full percentage point in the session. It, too, has had some interesting moves, uh, tick by tick, over the last two sessions or so. One report from Bloomberg is that Apple's next big thing is a robot that follows you around the house. Here with the scoop. Who else? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Th this was an interesting one. There is technology parallels for this latest initiative out of Project Titan. But just explain what we're talking about here, a robot that follows you around the house. Hey, Ed, yes, thank you so much for having me. You're, you're absolutely right. If you think about it, a self-driving car essentially is a robot. But the big difference between a self-driving car that roams around city streets and one that roams around uh, your, your house is the liability and it's the safety. If the self-driving car stops working properly on the road, maybe you get into a car accident and potentially kill someone, unfortunately. If your self-driving robot crashes into a wall in your home, it's kind of, so what? Right. And so it's similar technology, but the stakes are so much lower. Uh, the, the necessity to be accurate is so much lower. It is an easier thing to pull off. And it feels like the timing is, is right for Apple to be exploring this. If you think about the backdrop of when the Apple Car project was canceled, the, the newfound struggles being faced uh, by Tesla, the profitability issues being faced by Lucid and Rivian and any EV maker you can think of. And then at the same time, you're sort of seeing the technology industry shift to AI powered hardware, you're seeing talk about humanoid robots. So it does make sense for Apple to be exploring at least this shift. Although iRobot hasn't exactly had a wondrous time post its unfolding of, a, of an Amazon acquisition. Uh, Mark, I'm interested as to where this gets built within Apple, because they've been saying they're moving around a lot of the ultimate talent to go into the AI area and generative AI, but who builds this within Apple? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So the artificial intelligence organization at Apple under John Gianandrea, he used to run search and uh, was a senior executive at Google before joining Apple in 2018. Uh, some of the underlying AI and robotics work is going on within his organization. And then Apple has a hardware engineering group uh, dedicated to home devices that's run by a guy named Matt Costello, who was actually the chief operating officer at Beats until that company was famously acquired by Apple a decade ago. And so this is a, a a cross company effort between those two groups primarily. Now, the other thing I want to call out, in addition to the home robot, Apple is very in depthly exploring the addition of robotics to other types of devices. So, uh, one thing that they've been working on actually secretly for about three years, four years at this point, is a tabletop robot. It's essentially a gigantic iPad on a robotic arm. And it's actually pretty cool. So, you could be on a FaceTime call and the display, thanks to the robotic arm, would move to mimic the head movements like a nod or your head turning or a laugh or whatnot going on on the other side of the FaceTime call. So it feels a bit more like a telepresence environment. So certainly robotics, I believe wholeheartedly this is a new big area for Apple moving forward. They're starting to throw a little resources at it, and I think that's going to grow exponentially over the past or over the next several years. One thing to note is although hundreds and hundreds of people were laid off from the Apple Car project and no longer have a job at Apple, uh, at least a few teams from that car project were actually repurposed for some of this AI and robotics work. So clearly an intense area of focus right now. Yeah. albeit extraordinarily right. early in the product development process. When you believe something wholeheartedly, Mark, the world believes something wholeheartedly. We thank you very much indeed, Mark Gurman, of course, our key Apple correspondent. Coming up, we're going to have a deep dive for you. COO of OpenAI, Brad Lightcap, joining us for a discussion wide-ranging the state of enterprise AI adoption as well as consumer AI adoption and, of course, some of the areas of focus for them. Legal on one side, but also opportunities on the next. This is Bloomberg Technology.
For our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide, OpenAI is top of mind across the world of technology. That includes for Elon Musk, who posted on X overnight that his EV company Tesla is having to boost compensation to ward off approaches for its AI talent. Those approaches, claims Musk, include OpenAI. Ethan Knight, a member of Tesla's team working on computer vision for FSD, was approached by OpenAI, so Musk moved him to his own AI company, XAI. Let's get to the OpenAI side of the story. Let's talk about talent. Let's talk about what's happening in the world of artificial intelligence. Brad Lightcap, OpenAI COO, joins us here in New York City. There's no accusation that anything wrong was done, but it highlights an interesting point right now. There is a lot being done on the training of prior generation models, future generation models. There is a finite amount of talent. Give the open AI side of this equation, how much of a premium are you having to pay out? I don't know if it's salary or, or stock or, or uh, engineering freedom to get the top names. Well, thank you, Ed and Caroline, for having me. Uh, it's great to be with you. You know, look, this is a competitive market for sure. Um, it's an amazing place uh, that we're at because there's very uh, few number of people that can really make such a dramatic impact in this field. But we try and pull people uh, into our mission, and I think that's historically what's been our strength, is um, people want to build in the place where uh, we're pushing the frontier the furthest, um, and also where we really think about the impact of the technology, both uh, on a societal level and then also on an applied and industry level. How big is OpenAI now? How many employees, and where are they? We're about 1,200 people. 1,200? Um, yes, mostly in San Francisco, uh, but also in, uh, in London and Dublin. Um, and increasingly other places in the world. Increasingly other places in the world, the reporting was that Japan is the next frontier for you. What's the strategy there and where you choose? I don't know whether you call it opening a new market, but where you choose to have operations. Well, we're very fortunate. We have a very uh, global base of demand. So we want to show up where our customers are. We think this is going to be a global transformation. Uh, we feel a lot of pull from, uh, from places like Japan and Asia broadly. Uh, and so we'll, we'll show up where we feel like we need to be. And let's talk about where you show up from an industry perspective. You're here in New York talking to partners. We understand Sam and, and the teams have been in Hollywood discussing how Sora can be used, but ultimately how you can have a working relationship with companies and industries that think they're going to be upended. Talk to us about how those conversations are going, for example, with Hollywood and publications. Yeah. You know, we, we take a very unique perspective here. We really model OpenAI as a partnerships company. And we think this transformation is going to be very broad-based. And so we're one company. We can't do everything ourselves. Being able to find ways to partner with industry, uh, with countries, um, with, with specific companies, uh, that's really important to our mission uh, and the way that we think about bringing technology to the world. Um, by way of recent example, we work really closely actually with the publishing industry right now mm -hmm. on ways that we can deploy AI into publishing to make the quality of journalism better, uh, to make the quality of reader experiences better. Uh, we've heard nothing but uh, really uh, actually a lot of enthusiasm from that industry. And so we're always looking at ways that we can partner with industry. Uh, I expect a lot more from us in the future on this front. Uh, yeah. And, and sort of a great example of where uh, we really are excited about the impact that we can make in media. It's interesting that media now companies over in Europe, for example, seem to have got with that quite quickly. Actual Spring mm -hmm. are a key deal that you sort of birthed early days. And Actual Spring are therefore seen from business side are perhaps a little bit more blue links within ChatGPT. New York Times ain't on that discussion point right now. How is that legal fight and indeed behind the scenes discussion going with those sorts of companies? Well, I can't comment on the New York Times case specifically, uh, other than to say we, we think it's without merit. But um, the overwhelming majority of what we hear from the publishing industry is actually quite positive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a high level of excitement everywhere about what these tools can do, both to unlock better journalism, to give readers more access to information, um, to enhance the way that people engage with content. So uh, the way that we actually think about even the fundamental business of, of information engagement and consumption. Um, these things are all really possible now with language models uh, and, and increasingly with multimodal models too. So um, we think we're just starting to scratch the surface on that opportunity. We've got a lot more to share there soon, uh, but uh, stay tuned. You're being positive, being optimistic. Of course you are. What's interesting is I come away from meetings where Hollywood is deeply anxious. People in my industry are deeply anxious. Goodness, everyone with a job is trying to work out how they adopt AI. And also there's this question that is ongoing of open versus closed. 
You're going for another legal fight at the moment. Elon Musk has dragged you into it and wants you to rename yourself. Where do you sit on the closed versus open? How much more open do you have to become? Yeah, well, look, I think we uh, really focus just on where we can deploy the technology and what's the best way to do that. And at the end of the day, we're going to focus on where our customers are and the way that they want to deploy it. Uh, we work with thousands of enterprises across the world. Um, we spend a lot of time working with those enterprises on ways that we can configure the technology specific to their use case, specific to their stack. Uh, and we think that the, the easiest way to do that is the way that we serve it. Um, but that's not to say that you know, we wouldn't look at other ways in the future. Uh, we really ultimately want to be where we think uh, the best place to deploy the technology is going to be. For our Bloomberg television and radio audience worldwide, we're in New York City speaking to OpenAI COO Brad Lightcap. I, I want to learn more about where OpenAI sits uh, in its growth, its day-to-day -day operations. You know, you just said thousands of enterprises. We, we came to know you because of the, the explosive response to ChatGPT, and that was principally in the context of a consumer-facing chatbot. But it sounds very much like growth now is focused on that enterprise arrangement, licensing of technology. Can you give me proportions, the rate of growth for those two pillars? Well, we've, we've seen tremendous growth in the enterprise. You know, 24 is going to be the year of adoption for AI in the enterprise. We felt really like 23 was the year that people just started to wrap their head around what was possible with AI in the enterprise. But increasingly, the market is pulling us toward real applications that are delivering real business results uh, and a very broad focus on AI enablement. So uh, how do we think about bringing AI both to our operations, but also to our workforces, uh, and then also to new product experiences that we can deliver to customers? Um, and we work with plenty of companies that are doing all three of those things at the same time. We think that's very possible. Uh, and it's having really dramatic bottom line impact today. So this is what we think uh, the pull is going to be, and, and, and we're ready to support. Uh, Brad, you're the COO, so I'm assuming you're responsible for also some of the purse strings involved in, in OpenAI's finances. Compute must be a really considerable cost right now. Uh, and with that, the energy consideration as well. Are you making enough revenue from this enterprise business to, to keep the lights on when you factor in the compute costs involved? We are, yes, uh, we're, we, we think that we have, uh, well, first of all, a very diversified business. And so we serve hundreds of millions of users uh, with our ChatGPT product. Mm -hmm. um, and many of those users are paying users. Of course, we serve uh, now over 600,000 uh, individual users in the enterprise with ChatGPT Enterprise. Um, and so we're just seeing tremendous momentum. Uh, we're very early innings on this. And so we look at it as, hey, this is, this is the start of something. Um, and ultimately, our priority is just to be able to deliver the best intelligence uh, whether it's in the enterprise or to individuals, uh, that's the most useful that drives the biggest, bu biggest business impact. Cara, I'm thinking back to the conversation we had uh, the other day with um, Daniel Amade from Anthropic, and what she explained, Brad, was the relationship of AWS and, and Bedrock. They're getting a lot of business through that. You have a quite similar and, and actually a pre-existing situation with Microsoft and Azure. Are you able to explain how much new business comes through that conduit of the Microsoft relationship and, and what were probably existing as your enterprise customers? We're really fortunate to have Microsoft as a partner. Um, they've been an amazing partner with us for a long time. We've increasingly looked at the world as uh, ways that we can bring open AI technology to life together. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate that they're, they're offering our models through their Azure OpenAI service, but um, we have an independent business, so we serve, uh, we serve customers independently of Microsoft. Um, and Is that uh, one bigger than, than the, the Microsoft Avenue? Yeah, look, we, you know, we're, 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 it's, it's, it's fluid between the two, but um, we really are uh, focused on what's best for, for, for the companies we work with, and um, we're very fortunate to be able to diversify the surfaces in which we offer our products. We think the demand for this technology is massive, and so uh, being the, a smaller company, obviously, um, having a partner that can help bring the technology to scale uh, is really, really advantageous for us, yeah. um, and we're excited to support them in the future. It's an extraordinary, very novel kind of partnership. And in fact, the whole of AI is birthing these kind of frenemy relationships. Frenemy. I just think of also aqua hires, deals that seem to be going. Now, Microsoft has just seemingly aqua hired the whole of inflection. What did you make of that particular move, particularly when suddenly you've got what, the co-founder of DeepMind coming in to be the head of consumer AI at Microsoft, and ultimately you put out a response to that, being like, congratulations. But 
How did that make you feel as the previous partner of choice for Microsoft? Well, we're excited for them. Uh, we congratulate Mustafa and Karen and the whole team. And uh, we work very closely with Microsoft. And so uh, we think that's going to be a, a major advantage for our partnership as well. Um, we're focused on what we can, you know, what we can control on the OpenAI side, um, which for us right now is really thinking about the next wave of the technology uh, and thinking about ways that that wave is going to start to enable businesses. Um, and the more we can think about that problem together, the better we'll, we'll all be. A lot of CEOs that I speak to, some of them are your customers, say they're technology agnostic right now. In other words, they might use GPT or another foundation model. They might also be building their own in parallel. And when we told our audience you were coming on the show, a lot of people wanted to get your thoughts on the Palantir relationship. It's an interesting case study. They, they seem to be one of the beneficiaries of the enterprise investment in AI, or at least the data analytics side. What's it like working with Alex Karp? Yeah, well, we, you know, we, we actually work with a bunch of partners that help us bring the technology to life. And there's so many ways to deploy the technology in the enterprise. That's what's kind of amazing about this technology is it's not just one function in the enterprise or one part of the enterprise stack. Uh, it's so diverse uh, and it's so broad based. And so um, we work with, 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 with many partners to, to bring that to life. And um, we'll continue to look for partners to, to work with to, to help us do that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we, you know, look, we're, um, uh, we're excited with, with, with the way Palantir has, has been enabling their customers on top of our technology, uh, and we'll continue to support them going forward. Brad, uh, I, every day it crosses my desk, you know that I've done quite a lot of reporting on Sam's chip ambitions as well. There's some relationship going on between the UAE and, and OpenAI, fundraising or technology partnerships. Can you clarify what's going on there and why you'd need to raise funds from somewhere like that? Yeah, well, look, I, I won't comment specifically on that. We uh, broadly, though, believe that there's just not enough total supply uh, in the world and that of um, AI accelerators specifically. Of AI accelerators and broadly that the supply chain will need to adapt to what we think is going to be uh, this highly inflected and, and nearly exponential demand in the next 10 years. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about ways that uh, we can make sure that that demand is met. Part of it is just being able to bring our models to bear, but upstream of that is obviously making sure that the actual underlying hardware and infrastructure exists to be able to build the systems that we need to ultimately serve that demand. And so, um, you know, we, we, we think a lot about it. and. Um, you know, our, our hope there is uh, that the, the supply chain starts to think about that the same way we do. Brad, your, your mantra, your manifesto, your focus is to build artificial general intelligence for the good of humanity. And I speak to a lot of humans who are terrified. Can you encapsulate how you can, without regulation being there in place yet, and the EU's sort of putting the gauntlet out there, you're doing all of this without disrupting too much? too quickly, too hard? Yeah, well, look, central to our mission is to make sure that we bring the technology in a way that's safe and that creates broad benefit. It's really encoded into how OpenAI was structured, uh, and it is actually the thing that we spend uh, our time thinking about how to deliver in real world results today. Um, and so we're very optimistic, um, and I can understand where uh, the fear comes from. Uh, it, things are moving very fast. Even for us at the center of it, uh, it sometimes is dizzying. But um, look, our perspective is that this is an, an enabling technology at its core. It's going to make businesses more efficient. It can make people more productive. It can be dramatically inflecting in how people learn, how people can understand information. Um, and so we think that that has uh, a very broadly positive effect on the world. Um, and the world that we wake up to 10 years from now uh, will be one that we look back on uh, you know, and really are, are, uh, are excited to be able to go build uh, today. And um, you know, we're, we're, that's, that's, that's really what we wake up every day and want to go do. So. We want to thank you being in the house with us, the COO of OpenAI, Brad Lightcap there, joining us in New York. We thank him. Paramount is getting closer to a deal to merge with Skydance. It's a production company founded by independent producer David Ellison, of course, son of Larry. Sherry Redstone is controlling shareholder of Paramount and has reached a tentative agreement to sell her stake to Skydance. Now, both parties have even agreed on the broad framework of a deal to combine. 
and will use a 30-day window of exclusive talks to iron out the details. All of this according to sources. Ed, what's so interesting is when you deep dive on the market reaction, positive. Analysts are saying there are more questions than answers yeah. right now. Uh, and I, I am more confused about the future of Paramount than I... And I know that's a cop-out, but that is literally what Blooming Intelligence writes, raises more questions than answers. One of the concerns is this deal was done between voting right shareholders. What about all the non-voting yeah. right shareholders? It's very complicated. Where's their value when an emerged entity? But what this does do is remain paramount as a whole and ultimately also a publicly traded yeah. company rather than being split up as Apollo is potentially suggesting and just taking bits of the assets. Keeping the library, that's right. But real deals, real offers on the table, that's a key takeaway. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Boy, what that was quite a conversation with OpenAI. Check it out. Recap on the podcast, Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg platforms. This is Bloomberg Technology.